Madam President-elect, dear Maryam Rajavi, honorable survivors, relatives of victims and witnesses of the atrocities in the 80s present here today or participating um, from a distance. Dear interpreters, allowing us to understand each other, my gratitude. Dear colleagues and friends of a free and democratic Iran, thanks to the unlimited efforts of this organization, the events of, in particular, 1988, are still present as if they had happened yesterday. The link to the executions of this year, 2024, becomes more and more evident since the new president of Iran is in office. A moderate government? No, no way. On the contrary, we observe, on the one hand, a beautiful country, but on the other hand, led by a theocratic dictatorship that the people of Iran have not and do not deserve. What can we do? Today, we have heard analysis of factual and legal situation in Iran about 40 years ago and today. It was with personal gratitude that Professor Rahman uh, also today delivered a basis for the work to be done. Some of his suggestions can be found at the end of his extraordinary valuable report. His call for accountability directed towards new mechanisms and assistance by international organizations or other countries exercising universal jurisdiction represented in this room also today. It's with special emphasis on the rule of uh, this universal jurisdiction exercised in Sweden, but also in other countries, in particular in the European um, Union. Uh, the added value has already been emphasized uh, by uh, Mark Ellis and also uh, by um, Professor uh, Lewis. Uh, the only question remains for me, wouldn't it be helpful that some countries work together in certain areas. It's an enormous amount of um, time and of course also money to hear out single cases one day in Sweden, next day in Germany, the other day in France. Uh, the European Union has an institution called Eurojust. Uh, the uh, task of this uh, unit is to assist countries in the European Union for a transferral of cases, of bringing cases together. This would avoid the additional and parallel workload so that one day um, uh, all the cases um, dealing with Iran could be, say, uh, brought before the courts in Sweden. Other cases, for example, uh, Germany at present is seized with, with the fate of the Yazidi women and girls in Syria uh, could be express, uh, explicitly uh, focused in Germany. So uh, this is only one added point, but I totally agree with your both uh, assessment of universal jurisdiction and the cases we have already heard. This striving for accountability must be saluted. It is, however, dependent on a strong political will of other countries. Is this present? I never give up the hope that there will be such a dominant political will to bring justice also to the people of Iran. On the other hand, we have to be realistic. As for the realization of the desirable avenues in the near future, in this particular fragile world, 
Notwithstanding, we have to give priority to these official tools of justice as said, if it's possible. But this organization, Madam President-elect, can right this wrong by own actions. It is already acquainted with. We most, must go one step higher from at most valuable means of inquiry to a tribunal established by the civil society of Iran represented by exile organizations led by Maryam Rajavi. By the way, already, as it was mentioned right now, um, already in 1966 we had such an example. We had the Russell Tribunal, also known as International War Crimes Tribunal, at that time already in 1966, a private people's tribunal organized by Bertram Russell, Jean-Paul Sartre, and others. This tribunal um, investigated, in particular, the military intervention in Vietnam. Very important at that time, I recall. What is the added value of such a tribunal or court established by civil society? It serves better the necessary truth-finding mission in the interest of all the victims. Cross-examination and additional questions put to the witnesses by the judge will fine-tune the truth in light of applicable international norms. The presence of international, well-equipped judges, impartial and independent as they must be, will show that justice can be seen to be done also on this level. Finally, a judgment will fix the results of such a procedure for the future of domestic or international courts. The results may present cogent reasons for the establishment or an international court or tribunal. The evidence admitted in such a procedure can also be admitted into evidence at a later stage by foreign courts, international tribunals, or in the most optimistic way of thinking, in a new democratic society on the territory of Iran, including, of course, an impartial jurisdiction in Iran. That's what we need. The awareness of transparent justice will also hopefully contribute to a transition in peace in Iran without any bloodshed and having abolished the death penalty. Let me be abundantly clear. I'm talking about a tribunal seized solely with international atrocity crimes forming at the same time international crimes in particular committed as widespread and, in this case, and um, systematic attacks. To go beyond in the area in, of international arms conflicts must left to the by, uh, ICC. Um, in passing, simply to say, it should be, the ICC should be encouraged to investigate also in how far the Mullah regime is involved on the crime, in the crimes committed since 7 October 2023 in the Near East conflicts. Uh, the establishment of such a tribunal should be vested to this organization. Prosecutors, judges, and defense counsel acting in the absence of defendants must be of highest integrity and have shown that they are willing and able to exercise such a function in a professional way. The tribunal should work in public and be broadcasted in order to attract even more awareness about the underlying crimes. The indictment must be drafted 
with utmost precision and focus on a limited number of most serious crimes allegedly committed by highest ranking individuals in and from Iran. Defense and judges must be confronted with this indictment well in advance of the beginning of the main proceedings. It is to apply the Rome Statute of the ICC and its rules, procedure and evidence, mutatis mutandis, however, allowing for a trial in absentia of the defendants. Dear friends and colleagues, I'm about to lose myself in technicalities. Thus, I should come to an end. But before doing so, it has to be emphasized that even a two or three days trial is extremely time consuming in its preparation. Spending more time for preparation enhances credibility of the result. Inappropriate expeditiousness may cause a farce. That's not what we want. What we want is coming as close as possible to truth and justice, serving as a fundamentum for peace. This can, can be done by our way to show accountability. We can ourselves achieve this goal. We have to engage in the establishment of such a tribunal, and please allow me a working title only, the National Councils of Resistance Tribunal for the prosecution of serious international crimes committed on the territory of Iran since 1980 against Iranian people in particular of other political opinion or religious beliefs. As I said, this would only be one additional avenue of achieving accountability, transparency and justice and to show who was responsible. I hope that you can think about this topic and come to the same result as I do, hoping for this future. And I have to thank you very much. <laughs>